everyone, it's me, Aaron, and after a long month, it is finally time that we reach the finale of Comic Crypt. Yes, I know that technically there is one more Wednesday in October, but that Wednesday is Halloween, so we've got a special video planned all just for that day. So this is it. This is our final look at Spooky Comics for the year. Don't worry, we will be back again next year. And of course, in two Wednesdays, we will return to our normal episodes of Comic Class, where we just geek out about comic books every single week. And for our final episode of Comic Crypt, I can't lie to you guys, I actually had a completely different book planned to talk about today. But last week, the trade paperback for Jeff Lemire's brand new series, Gideon Falls, finally came out, and I blazed through that in a single night because oh my gosh it's easily one of my favorite books of the entire year i always love jeff lemire's stuff however i think it works way better in trades i always read the first issue of his series and i think all right that's you know that's that's all right it's a pretty unique idea there's some cool visuals in there but you know i don't really get a feeling of where it's going yet. I don't totally understand what the series is going to be about. I need some time to process it, put it all together. I need to see how everything is going to play out before I can form a stronger opinion about it. And the same was true about Gideon Falls. I read the first issue of that when it came out and I just looked at it like, well, that was okay. I, I liked it. I mean, it looks fantastic and you know, I guess these characters seem all right here in the beginning, but I really need a little bit more time on this one. So I decided to wait until the trade came out, and as I said, it just came out last week, and I am still blown away by this. I'm recording this literally right after I finished reading it. So yeah, you guys are going to have to forgive me if I'm just geeking out a little bit and still just trying to process everything and put it all together in my head. Now, what is Gideon Falls all about? Well, it focuses on a pastor by the name of Wilfred, although everyone in town just calls him Father Fred, and he is currently going through a bit of a crisis of faith. And the bishop has seen this in him. He realizes that Father Fred is a bit lost, but he knows that there is an exact place that Father Fred is needed right now. This small town named Gideon Falls recently lost their own pastor, so they need someone else in there. So he gets sent down to this town, even though Father Fred is saying, yeah, I'm not really in a good place right now in order to answer these people's questions. Uh, these people might be having their own little crisis of faith, and I don't really know if I can provide them with the guidance that they're going to need. But the bishop, who, by the way, we never see. We only ever see the back of the bishop sitting at a giant chair. It is beautifully crafted how the bishop is always introduced in every single scene. Anyway, the bishop just keeps telling him, don't worry, there's a higher calling here. You're exactly where you need to be. That's always what he keeps saying to him. And as the series goes along, you begin to realize, oh, uh, that might just not be him blowing some hot air. It might actually be that Father Fred was actually destined to arrive in Gideon Falls. Because on the very first night that Father Fred arrives in town, he starts seeing some things that really kind of defy any sort of rational thought. He sees a giant black barn out in the middle of nowhere, and he ends up discovering a dead body at that exact same spot after being guided to that location by a mysterious messenger who I will not say who it is because I don't want to spoil anything. In fact, I'll go ahead and let you guys know right now, I'm going to be super vague in my description about Gideon Falls because almost every single thing that happens in this book after chapter one kind of spoils everything. It's one of those books where I can't even really show you too many panels of this series simply because, yeah, almost every single panel will include some information that will spoil your enjoyment of learning that information. But Father Fred isn't the only character that we're following in this story. We're also introduced to a man who's constantly wearing a disposable face mask, the kind that you would wear when you're, say, painting a house or around toxic fumes. And he suffers from several mental disorders. He suffers from depression, anxiety, hallucinations, but he also has an obsession. He constantly has to search through trash because he feels like bits of the trash are reaching out to him. Bits of the trash are telling him that they're important and he's been collecting these pieces all around the city. Now, when I read the first issue of this, I really had no idea where this was going. And I looked at this character and I went, okay, 
I think this is going to be some kind of a serial killer story. And this guy right here is very obviously going to be the villain. This guy is suffering some kind of massive mental disorder. It's leading him down a dark path. He keeps talking about how he feels like the entire city is covered in darkness. And he now believes that there is pure evil out there. That there actually is physical evil and it's getting closer to him. And when I read that, I thought, oh man, this guy is going to think that Father Fred is the devil and he's going to end up hunting Father Fred down. This is going to be some kind of a serial killer situation in here, some sort of Silence of the Lamb thing going on. That's what happened at the end of issue number one when he found that dead body. That was this serial killer hunting this person down. I don't quite understand the weird giant barn that the father saw at the end of issue number one, but yeah, that's gotta be what this is. That's what I think this story is about. And wow, as this story develops, man was I wrong. That character was nothing like I expected him to be. He actually, for the vast majority of the first trade, turns out to be someone who is very clearly one of the good guys. He is very clearly trying to fight the actual evil thing that is in this book. But then, not to get too spoilery here, but at the end of the first trade, he decides to start doing a thing that made me look at him and go, Okay, uh, I don't believe you're a bad guy, but this might lead to some bad things things. That's one of the amazing things about this book. That's one of the amazing things about just the way that Jeff Lemire writes characters in general is that you keep looking at all these characters and you think, okay, well clearly I've got you all figured out. And then a couple pages later it's like, nope, have no idea. And it's not just mysteries about their past, it's just their morals. A lot of these characters are morally gray or they might seem like they're all good but then they've got that one dark thing in their past or they might seem all dark but then there's an explanation for it but they might actually be dark for a good reason. That's the kind of characters that Jeff Lemire just masterfully is able to write and this book is full of them. In fact, there's so many characters in this book who I kept looking at when they were first introduced and thinking, okay, well, that character is just never going to return. We're just going to see them for this one page. That's it. And then, no, that character ends up becoming a huge deal. I remember when the sheriff popped up in the second issue. I don't know why. I just kind of looked at her and I was like, okay, she's just kind of here for this. Maybe she'll pop up a couple issues later. No, she actually becomes front and center in this story. And it's heavily implied she's actually going to be one of the major characters in the second trade. Same thing goes for the therapist who is helping Norton, the man who keeps collecting all this trash because he believes that it's talking to him. When she popped up in the first issue, I thought, okay, well, she's just here to give us backstory on Norton. She's just here to basically explain, okay, this is everything wrong with you. This is your past. This is all the little things that the audience needs to know about your character. I'll pop up again in maybe a couple of issues after you've gotten way worse, and then I will basically address the situation from there. I will probably provide some kind of a conflict for you, Norton, later on, but that's kind of the only role that I'm going to serve in here. Nope, she is a major character in here, and where her story goes, I was not expecting it, and I definitely wasn't expecting it so quickly. That's another thing about this book. It moves at a wonderful pace. Pacing is so important when building a mystery, when crafting horror, and Jeff Lemire absolutely nails how quickly this story should be moving. By the end of every single issue, not only will characters not be where they were at the beginning of the issue, they won't even be close to it, but it's not like they've changed so much within the span of a single issue that you're like, well, this just isn't believable. After everything that these characters experience, after everything that they go through, you would absolutely understand why these characters are now acting the way that they are, the new things that they believe. Like, for example, the father, yeah, he sees this thing, the black barn out there in the woods, and he starts finding out a little bit more about it, and he starts asking other people about and he does eventually by the end of the first trade believe what he saw he definitely believes the black barn is a thing it's something supernatural it's something evil but it's not like he talks to one person who goes this is the backstory of the black barn and then he's like well now i understand it all no he actually runs into that crazy old guy who believes in the black barn and he's like all right you know what it's clearly something in my head it's something scientific uh, I'm not buying any of this because yes, 
if you were a rational, sane, thinking person and you saw something completely unexplainable, the first thing that you would try to do is explain it. And if somebody comes up to you and instantly starts saying, it's something pure evil, you wouldn't necessarily believe them. You would have doubts. You might start thinking in the back of your head, what if that person is right? But yeah, you wouldn't instantly buy it. But after you've run into this thing two or three more times and you've seen a little bit more of it, you would finally have to cave in and go, yeah, okay, I'm on your side now. I fully believe what you just said. But before I move too far away from the characters in here, I do also want to applaud that Jeff Lemire didn't just take characters who I wasn't expecting to be big deals and made the major part of the stories. He made every single character in here, no matter how small of an appearance they had, feel real. They all felt like actual human beings who had lived their own lives. There is an instance in here in which the father is talking to a former doctor. He says, so do you still practice medicine? And he just pauses real quickly and goes, uh, no, uh, I haven't for some time. And I just looked at that and instantly went, well, that guy is going to have a rich, deep backstory that I can't wait to learn. Just from one little line. That is how well he is able to craft these characters. And that's not just thanks to Jeff Lemire's ability to write dialogue or his ability to build up backstories for characters. A lot of the reality of these characters also comes from the art. The artist Andrea Sorrentino and especially the colorist Dave Stewart are able to make these characters feel absolutely real. You look at them and they're not too exaggerated. They're covered in this classic Sorrentino art style of grittiness and extra shading, but that adds to the down-home feel that all these characters are supposed to have. It really makes them feel more like salt-of-the-earth people, people who grew up out there in the country where you have to work on your hands every single day. But then when you move into the city, that grittiness actually adds to a noir sense. And a lot of the times when you're out in the wilderness, you're following the father and the sheriff, and yeah, that style actually adds to that realistic nature of all these characters. But when you move into the city, you're following Norton. And Norton has this great mystery of, was the trash trying to tell him? Was he trying to discover out there? And then all of a sudden, Sorrentino's art style, it does add to a noir sense to it. It works perfectly for both storylines that are being pitched in this book. And again, I have to give a ton of credit to the colorist, Dave Stewart, because not only does he capture these perfect earthy tones whenever he wants to make the book look realistic, but whenever they get supernatural, that's when Dave Stewart shines. Again, yes, Jeff Lemire sets every single scare up. Andrea Sorrentino is able to masterfully depict how every single panel should be laid out whenever they want to frighten you. That's another thing that I really have to point out. Jeff Lemire and Sorrentino work together beautifully to master the art of freaking you out when you turn the page. Because when you turn that page, they know how to just present you with something that will just make you jump back. There is one panel in here that when I flip to it, I'm not going to bleep this, so I apologize for my language. I literally looked at and just went, shit. It's that good of a panel. But again, the thing that makes all these panels stand out, the thing that makes them jump out at you so much when you flip the page and just make you feel like you just entered into a completely different reality, which is how you should feel when this sudden magical barn just comes into existence, is the colors. It's how the colors, Dave Stewart, is able to go, hey, here's the exact thing that you were just looking at a second ago. Now everything is turned on its head just by the hard contrast in the colors from one panel to another. And speaking of the barn itself, if you guys have been watching our movie reviews that we've been doing all month long in which we take a look at spooky, scary movies, you've probably heard me mention many times over, I'm actually a big fan of American cryptids and American horror stories. I am a huge fan of those, not just ghost stories, but those paranormal things that no one can explain, but multiple people in a small town have all kind of experienced around the same time or over the course of a couple of decades. The sort of things kind of like the Mothman, for example. The sort of things where people who in no way could possibly have been in contact with each other over the course of many years are all starting to share similar stories. And these stories, it took several years for them to all come to light, but they all kind of line up in a way that makes you wonder, 
oh, could this actually be real? And that's exactly the way that Jeff Lemire is crafting the story of The Black Barn. Over the course of this month, I've watched many movies and also have watched a couple documentaries about these real life stories that people have had about their paranormal encounters. And Jeff Lemire must have watched some of these documentaries as well. He must have studied this stuff too, because there is a moment in which he finds a room just covered in newspapers that are all talking about stories that could quite possibly be linked to the Black Barn, and it's exactly how this stuff felt like in those documentaries. When people are coming in with their different stories about, oh, this person went missing, this thing happened to this person, I remember seeing this thing, but no one believed me. All completely different stories, but if you line them up, they all kind of paint a similar picture of this strange thing happening in one small town. That is the exact feel that Jeff Lemire is able to capture in this book, and he's able to do it far better than I have ever seen in any comic. But that is it. I can't go into any more details about this book. Again, as I said earlier on, I'm very sorry that I couldn't even show you too many panels of this book, so I know this video has probably been kind of boring and repetitive with the images popping up on the screen, but it's that kind of a book. It's the kind of book where I would be on issues four or five and I would see a panel that I would think was gorgeous and I would think to myself, I have to use that panel in the video to show people why they need to read this book and to demonstrate all the stuff that I'm talking about in the video, but then I would realize that all the dialogue in that panel and all the people involved in that panel would be massive spoilers for the things that happened in earlier issues. But, trust me on this one, this is easily my favorite horror book of the year right now. It has gained one of my highest recommendations of any book that I have talked about this year. It's also being turned into a TV show, because of course it is. If you're a popular book over at Image these days, you're going to be turned into a TV show. But, in all honesty, before I even knew that, I was reading this thinking, this would make an amazing TV show. So before that TV show ends up coming out, go ahead and read this book because again, the artwork and the way that it's paced and the amazing work on presenting every single panel, it's something that no TV show could really capture. The TV show would have to be very different from this one. So this, even if you are one of those people that's like, ah, I'll wait for the TV show, don't do that on this one. You need to read this book. But that's it. That is the finale to Comet Crypt, everyone. As I said, we will be back in two weeks with our regular comic book show, but make sure to join us next Wednesday for our big Halloween blowout. Thanks for tuning in, everyone, and happy Halloween.